welcome to Awesome One M. Most women in Papua New Guinea remain illiterate with a low status in society. As we know, educating the female gender is also vital for sustainable development. In recent years, the number of girls going to school has improved, yet social and cultural barriers linger. Papua New Guinea's gender equity policy about educating women, educating the nation, is not working as effectively as it should, but has shown improvement in recent years. Women and girls continue to confront various forms of negative approaches that have weakened what should have been equal rights. During the 2015 National Women's Forum that was held in Port Mosby, some barriers to education for girls were addressed. Traditionally, uh, we know that the pressure from uh, parents and community for girls to remain back in the village, either to, for them to be married off or to assist with uh, household uh, um, work and even babysit or help with the garden work. Now these are the barriers that uh, we see. Um, and then you have the social barriers. Uh, social barriers may, may do with their own well-being, their own growth. Uh, uh, as individuals, we know that when they, most of them when they grow too old for school, uh, often they lose interest, they do not want to go to school. So we need to find ways to uh, ensure that they are put in school when they reach the right age. We are all aware of various negative social and cultural barriers which are deeply rooted in PNG culture. It will take time for this to be completely uprooted from societies. Parental pressure is always very important. Parental support and involvement in, in girls' education is critical. If parents' perceptions are uh, not consistent with the child's perception in terms of the purpose of education, then they're likely to uh, prevent, especially girls, from going to school. So we like to look at ways to try to prevent uh, uh, parents from doing that. But having said that, uh, we have made a lot of progress in terms of addressing cultural barriers for girls to education. For example, uh, people are advocating against the payment of bride price, People are now advocating against uh, early child uh, marriages and these are interventions that will uh, help to increase the opportunities for girls to go to school so that they don't get married when they are too young. Some of the education department's policies were categorized as irrelevant and a waste of time. The plan is a, is a very good plan. The intentions are very good. I would like to be able to uh, provide a conducive environment for girls to, to go to school and, and remain to complete a uh, cycle of education. Unfortunately, like all other plans and all other policies, we have, we, we have too many policies and too many plans. Where there is not a shortage of policies. However, the biggest drawback is that uh, these plans are not normally implemented and the desired outcomes are, are never attained. And in terms of the uh, gender equity policy, uh, the department hasn't done much uh, in terms of policy implementation, particularly at the school, school level. And there is no monitoring to ensure that uh, there are some improvements made at the, at the school level to ensure that uh, girls have access and they meaningfully participate and, uh, you know, conducive environment is provided, infrastructure uh, and, and other things provider so that girls uh, can go to school. The women's policy that was launched in 1992 by then Prime Minister Pius Winti clearly outlines the government's role in women's development issues. There is no shortage of education policies. We have existing policies but yet we come up with new policies. And many of these policies are not evidence-based. They're not based on any kind of evidence. There is no good baseline on what the policies are targeting. Policies are sometimes poorly formulated uh, with 
uh, outcomes that are sometimes very vague and difficult to attain. And uh, although many of them are costed, uh, resources are always diverted and reallocated to other areas, and as a consequence, the policies uh, suffer. So, Papua New Guinea has a history of uh, coming up with big policies, what I call big bang policies, uh, very big shifts, and we have committed a lot of resources, as you said, a lot of money, but we have acted very little. So what is required is, is that we have to look at the existing policies, we have to monitor them, we have to evaluate them to find out whether or not we are making any progress towards the objectives that have been set. And we make improvements to existing policies so that gradually we can achieve the outcomes of those policies, particularly at the school level. We, we need to improve access, we need to improve the quality of learning. Welcome back to Otsamwanam. Overlooking the needs of people with disabilities is still an issue in Papua New Guinea. Women and girls with disabilities also face serious challenges in accessing mainstream education facilities. This includes various forms of abuse as well. One factor that has stood out in recent years is people with disabilities. Girls and women in particular with disabilities have been subjected to various forms of violence, including humiliation, sexual abuse or torture. And you know, young girls with disabilities or women with disabilities when they're sexually harassed or even abused, that they have the right to also be uh, presented at the courts. I think the, the issue is that uh, the resources are not there to assist the laws, you know, the people who are serving out the justice. Uh, but that's not supposed to be an excuse. Uh, the government has con ratified the convention and therefore they have to provide those services. There's no laws in the country as yet specifically uh, targeting uh, disability, but there is a national policy on disability. The National Policy on Disability has 11 target areas. Um, it's, very, it's a very good policy. Our problem was that uh, the implementation of that policy was very slow. It was only in the last, I, I could say the last two years, that we have started to implement part of the policies. So the, the, uh, the Department for Community Development has now revised you know, this policy, incorporating what the, the gaps were, what the problems were, and trying to make this policy more uh, lively, more, yeah, make it a live document so that we can try to look at how we can, uh, you know, look at issues facing people with disabilities in this country. There are also growing concerns about the lack of assistance in mainstream schools in Papua New Guinea, where teachers lack specific skills and knowledge on how to deal with students with disabilities. In PNG, students born with disabilities continue to face difficulties when learning in classrooms. Humanitarian organizations like the UNICEF and UN say there is a great need in addressing this issue. We're not calling for special schools. We're not calling for special attention. We're calling for accessibility for all. And so when you are building a school, make sure that the child or the young girl in a wheelchair also accesses that building. Uh, a girl who is hearing impaired also accesses the resources and also accesses the services. So if, she, if a deaf girl goes to class, uh, she's not able to participate effectively because she cannot hear. But the government makes sure that when teachers are trained, they are also trained how to learn sign language. Uh, and that will take a while, but that's not to say we cannot do it. 
And so we are calling for the government because it is signed on the convention that it is a duty. There is a strong appeal now to the government to fully take into consideration the needs of people with disabilities. The Papua New Guinea National Policy on Disability is in place, but the implementation of this policy is very slow. From now on, uh, we would like to see that when buildings are built, that they have to use the universal access guideline. And it's available, it's made available. Uh, the Building Board Act, or the, yeah, the Building Board Act also has as an accessible, uh, I think it's Article 15 or Article 16, it says making sure that uh, there is physical access for people with disabilities. So it's there. It's just for the government to enforce those. And if they don't have it there, they have to look at the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability and try to see what the state's duties are. They have to do that. And I think that that is now something we would like to call the government to do. Working closely with the focal point for disability, which is the Department for Community Development, but it's a sectoral approach. So the health department makes sure that access to sexual and reproductive health messages, educational messages, are provided to young girls or women who have vision impairment and who have hearing impairment. And that requires resources to be provided as well. Uh, and it's not, our, it's not our duty as people with disabilities. That's the duty of the people and the government. Department of Education has inclusive education, not to discriminate against our children with disability. I know that NCD uh, Building Board, since 2004, I, I would, I'm not too sure of the year, but they've got it in, in their, um, in, in, I don't know, their rulings as well, that no build, upcoming buildings, uh, any upcoming buildings must be disability friendly. And so, um, um, what the department is trying to do, we'd like to work with our other partners um, to ensure that other sectors take care of their own by domesticating their legislations to suit the needs of our people here and especially including our people with disability. Welcome back. You're watching Ultram 1M. The compensation payment that many people in Papua New Guinea accept as a token of peace to relatives of a sexual abuse victim does not serve justice to the victim. In this segment, we highlight child abuse, which is a growing issue in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea has been carrying a battered image of high crime rate. Gender-based and sexual violence is a problem that is increasing throughout the country. Solving crime and other offenses out of the formal court system is one issue that has remained as the main challenge for Papua New Guinean societies. I have been, you know, a victim of domestic violence and every time I take my case to the police station, it's always thrown out. How do we connect with the legal system to make sure that justice is given? Many in rural areas, however, sometimes choose to solve the crime out of the formal court system and to a large extent make PNG's criminal laws ineffective. You know, actually we found out that in PNG, our society, in, in PNG, our culture and tradition, and our society is very strong. People embraced, you know, really believe in our tradition and custom. And that is also weakening our law. The cases that are not being, um, the perpetrators are not being charged and brought to the court is to do with compensation. And I'm thinking that is where it is. On 
Um, apart from the compensation, I think it's more to do with fear. And what do we have there to protect the victim, the mother, um, and the family from um, um, pursuing or, or pushing the case on? Pamela Crisimpa is a children's project officer with the Family Voice in Eastern Highlands Province. She emphasizes on child sexual violence, which is eating away every community in PNG. As we already know, many of the victims are abused by their own relatives or by people they know. Sexual abuse can, can affect any child. Um, we have had a case of uh, a child as young as one month old um, to 18 years old. Uh, sexual abuse or emotional abuse or physical abuse can affect any child of any home um, from the remotest you know, village in PNG right up to the high, children of highly educated um, elites of Papua New Guinea. And it comes in many forms, like um, child abuse, uh, you have the physical abuse where it involves beating, punching, slapping, and all that. And then you, you have verbal abuse, which involves like saying things to put children down. Um, also neglect is a form of abuse. And a lot of working parents, a lot of working parents, and I'm talking about highly the elites of the country, uh, we've neglected our children, and that's a form of abuse. We have no time for them. We don't check their schoolwork because we're so busy. And, and some of the abuse that happen are not meant, like the elites don't meant, uh, didn't, they never meant to abuse the child at, at the first instant. They want to provide the best by earning the best job, um, income from the, you know, the high job up there. But um, the neglect sort of comes in. the barriers of educating girls as well as the challenges faced by women and girls with disabilities. Imagine if education was easily accessible. Our world would be filled with empowering women regardless of their disabilities. UNICEF logo. Once upon a time there were two girls. They were just like you and me. The first girl was born to a mother who loved her a mother who made sure she was healthy and strong. A mother takes her baby to a clinic where she receives a vaccination. And who was lucky enough to have access to clean water. When she was old enough, she went to school. A young girl on a toilet and going to school with her brother. Where she was able to learn in a safe environment, form friendships that last a lifetime, and realize her dreams. A young girl growing up with her friends and then graduating from high school. She graduates and becomes a doctor. The second girl was born to a mother who loved her too. A mother carrying her baby steps on a landmine. But her mother was taken away and her future was changed. Instead of receiving love and care, she was hidden away. A young girl without legs watches her family eat through a keyhole. She was the last to be fed, and the last to get clean water. She uses a bucket for a toilet. While others went to school, she couldn't. Her brother goes to school and leaves her at home. She became vulnerable to neglect, violence, abuse, and exploitation. She is teased at school. Her society wasn't prepared for her, and now she's on the fringes of it. Now a young woman, she begs in the streets. But hold on a moment. What if, instead of abandoning that girl, we invested in her? The mother steps on a landmine, but the baby survives and is fitted with a wheelchair. 
What if we said no to stigma and discrimination? As a young girl, she eats with her family at the table. What if we cost-effectively gave her access to water, sanitation, and hygiene? And made sure she could attend the same school as her peers without disabilities? She uses an accessible toilet and speaks with her friends at school. She graduates and becomes a doctor. Well, I'd call that a good investment. Because the cost of exclusion is higher than the cost of inclusion. Let's build an inclusive society together. UNICEF. Invest in children. And that's all we have time for on Olsam 1M. If you have any comments or stories you would like to share, please contact us via the address on your screen or visit our Facebook page. For now, enjoy the rest of your viewing on your number one station, MTV.